What was the non-violent Indian reform movement? It was the movement led by Indian nationalist leader Mohandas Gandhi, 1869-1948. Whose methods of protest included staging boycotts, fasting, conducting prayer vigils, and visiting troubled areas in an attempt to end conflicts. Gandhi, whom the people called Mahatma, meaning great souled, was determined to bring about change in India to bring an end to British control of the country and to topple the ages-old caste system, the strict social structure, there. Gandhi believed that it took great courage to not engage in violence. And he began campaigns of passive resistance, which he called Satyagraha, meaning firmness in truth. Gaining a wide following, Gandhi's acts of civil disobedience did bring about changes in his homeland where he is revered as the founder of an independent India, 1947. He remained faithful to his nonviolent beliefs throughout his life. He also adhered to a firm policy of religious tolerance. It was for this reason that the spiritual and nationalist leader was killed by a Hindu extremist in 1948. What were the Articles of Confederation? This American document was the forerunner to the U.S. Constitution, 1788, drafted by the Continental Congress at York, Pennsylvania. On November 15, 1777, the Articles of Confederation went into effect on March 1, 1781, when the last state, Maryland, ratified them. The Articles had shortcomings that were later corrected by the Constitution. They provided the states with more power than the central government. Stipulating that Congress rely on the states both to collect taxes and to carry out the acts of Congress. It is largely thanks to Alexander Hamilton, 1755 to 1804, that the Articles were thrown out. Realizing they made for a weak national government. Hamilton led the charge to strengthen the central government even at the expense of the states. Eventually, he won the backing of George Washington, 1732-1799, James Madison, 1751-1836, John Jay, 1745-1829, and others, which led to the convening of the Philadelphia Constitutional Convention. Where the ineffectual Articles of Confederation were thrown out and the Constitution was drafted. One lasting provision of the Articles of Confederation was the Ordinance of 1787, signed in an era of westward expansion. The Ordinance set the guidelines for how a territory could become a state. A legislature would be elected as soon as the population had reached 5,000 voting citizens, which were men only. And the territory would be eligible for statehood once its population had reached 60,000. When was London's Westminster Abbey built?
The famed National Church of England was begun between 1042 and 1065 when Edward the Confessor, c. 1003 to 1066, built a church on the site of the abbey. King Henry III, 1207 to 1272, began work on the main part of Westminster in 1245 since the time of William the Conqueror, 1066, all of England's rulers. Except Edward V and Edward VIII, have been crowned at the church. The abbey is also a burial place of great English statesmen and literary giants. The latter are buried in the poet's corner. What happened in the Rwandan genocide? On April 6, 1994, the airplane carrying Rwandan President Juvenal Habia Ramana 1937-1994, of Rwanda's majority Hutu ethnic group, was shot down by unknown attackers. The event touched off, or was used as an excuse for, what one journalist described as a premeditated orgy of killing in which ethnic Hutu extremists carried out a campaign of mass murder against minority Tutsis. Ten years after the horrific events, the Chicago Tribune's Africa correspondent recounted how Rwanda's Hutu majority, equipped with machetes and called to action by government radio announcements, slaughtered neighbors, friends, co-workers. Priests killed parishioners who sought refuge in churches. Teachers murdered pupils. Hundreds of thousands of women were raped. Children burned or drowned, bodies pushed into mass graves. The massacre continued for three months. Ending only when Tutsi fighters managed to seize the capital at Kigali and take power. In 2004 the Rwandan government released its official estimate of the death toll. 937,000 people were murdered, making it the worst ethnic cleansing. The world has seen since the Holocaust during World War II, 1939-45. But, unlike the Holocaust, which was carried out by a dictatorial military machine. The Rwandan genocide was carried out by the masses. In the aftermath, more than 150,000 people were accused of participating in the massive violence. Though the Rwandan courts had only tried a small fraction of those no more than 10% in 10 years. An estimated 2 million Hutus, many who probably feared retribution, had fled to neighboring countries after the Tutsis gained power. The genocide had happened at the hands of many. In the decades since the Rwandan genocide, Rwandans and the world have grappled with difficult and perhaps unanswerable questions. What became of John Cabot's son, Sebastian? Sebastian, c. 1476-1557, who was born in Bristol, England, and sailed with his father on his successful expedition to North America the summer of 1497 did not take part in his father's ill-fated venture the following year. 
Had he done so, the world would have lost another great adventurer. Since that expedition was never heard from again. Instead, Sebastian stayed behind and pursued his father's cause and that of other merchant navigators. Who were determined to find overseas trade routes to the east. During his lifetime. Sebastian Cabot drew up maps for both the English and Spanish royalty and from 1525 to 1528 led a Spanish expedition that reached South America's Rio de la Plata and sailed into the Parana and Paraguay rivers. In 1544 Cabot published an engraved map of the world. And seven years later, under a pension from King Edward VI. 1537-1553, he founded the Merchant Adventurers of London. This group sponsored expeditions seeking a northeast passage, around Europe, to establish a trading route to the east. In so doing, the group affected trade with Russia. Why is Paul Revere's ride so well known? The April 18, 1775, event was famous in its own right but was memorialized by American writer Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. 1807-1882 In his poem, Paul Revere's Ride the verse contains an error, or perhaps Longfellow simply took literary license. About the night that the American Revolution, 1775-83, began, the light signal that was to be flashed from Boston's Old North Church. One light if the British were approaching the Patriots by land and two if the approach was by sea was sent not to Revere, it was received by Revere's compatriots in Charlestown, now part of Boston proper. However, Revere did ride that night on a borrowed horse. He left Boston at about 10 p.m. and arrived in Lexington at midnight to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock, who were wanted for treason, that the British were coming. The next day, April 19, the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought. Starting the Revolutionary War in America As an American patriot, Revere, 1735-1818, was known for his service as a special messenger. So much so that by 1773 he had already been mentioned in London newspapers. Revere also participated in the Boston Tea Party in 1773. Who are considered the founding fathers of the United States? The term is used to refer to a number of American statesmen who were influential during the revolutionary period of the late 1700s. Though definitions vary, most include the authors of the Declaration of Independence and the signers of the U.S. Constitution among the nation's founding fathers. Of the 56 members of the Continental Congress who signed the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. The most well-known are John Adams, 1735-1826, and Samuel Adams, 1722-1803, of Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin. 
1706-1790, of Pennsylvania, John Hancock, 1737-1793, of Massachusetts, and Thomas Jefferson. 1743-1826, of Virginia. The 39 men who signed the U.S. Constitution on September 17, 1787, include notable figures such as George Washington. 1732-1799, who would go on, of course, to become the first President of the United States. Alexander Hamilton, 1755-1804, who, as a former military aide to George Washington, went on to become the first U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, and James Madison, 1751-1836. Who is called the father of the Constitution for his role as negotiator and recorder of debates between the delegates? At 81 years of age, Benjamin Franklin was the oldest signer of the Constitution and was among the six statesmen who could claim the distinction of signing both it and the Declaration of Independence. The others were George Clymer. 1739 to 1813, Robert Morris. 1734 to 1806, George Red. 1733 to 1798, Roger Sherman. 1721 to 1793, and James Wilson. 1742 to 1798. Patriots and politicians conspicuous by their absence from the Constitutional Convention of 1787 were John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who were performing other government duties at the time and would each go on to become U.S. President, Samuel Adams and John Jay, 1745-1829. Who were not appointed as state delegates but who continued in public life, holding various federal and state government offices, including governor of their states, and Patrick Henry, 1736 1799, of Virginia, who saw no need to go beyond the Articles of Confederation, 1777, to grant more power to the central government. Henry's view on this issue foreshadows the discontent that crested nearly 100 years later when 12 southern states, including Virginia, seceded from the Union, causing the Civil War, 1861-65, to break out. Adams, Franklin, Hancock, Jefferson Washington, Hamilton, Madison, Jay, and Henry. These are the names that come to mind when the words Founding Fathers are uttered. Each of them had a profound impact in the political life of the United States even. Beyond their starring roles as patriots and leaders during the American Revolutionary Era. However, it's important to note that in many texts and to many Americans. The term Founding Fathers refers only to the men who drafted the U.S. Constitution since it is that document that continues more than 200 years after its signing to provide the solid foundation for American democratic government. Why was President Andrew Johnson impeached? In late February 1868 nine articles of impeachment were brought against Andrew Johnson over political and ideological differences between the President and Congress. Johnson self-educated, self-made, and outspoken inspired people to either love or hate him. A Southern Democrat in the U.S. Senate. 
he broke bonds of home and party when he swore allegiance to the Union after the outbreak of the Civil War, 1861-65. This he did because of his strong personal belief that the Southern states had violated the U.S. Constitution when they seceded from the Union. Soon this Tennessean and former Democrat shared the Union Party ticket with Republican Abraham Lincoln. 1809-1865, as he ran for re-election to the presidency in the fall of 1864. Inaugurated in March. Vice President Johnson became President Johnson that fateful mid-April day when Lincoln was. Shot as he sat watching a play at Washington, D.C.S. Ford's Theater. But Johnson's troubles had already begun. As he and Lincoln took the oath of office in March, Johnson appeared to be drunk. Some attributed this to the fact that he was recovering from typhoid fever. But one journalist labeled him a drunken clown and a group of senators began calling for his resignation. Lincoln met with his vice president for the first and what would turn out to be the last time on. April 14, just hours before Lincoln's life was claimed by assassin John Wilkes Booth, 1838-1865. As president, Johnson's true colors shine through. Again allegiant to his homeland, his policies toward southern states were lenient. Ever class conscious, he used the power of his office to demonstrate to the southern aristocrats, whom he openly despised, just how far a poor man from North Carolina had come, as a state's rights advocate. He was ever watchful of any congressional bills that might impinge upon the freedoms of the individual states. And as a racist, he proved reticent to grant rights or protection to blacks. All of these traits combined to create sticking points between Johnson and Congress. In February 1866 Congress voted to extend the life of the Freedmen's Bureau. A War Department agency that assisted blacks and whites. But Johnson vetoed the measure, and Congress was unable to overturn his veto. Later that year, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, a bill that extended citizenship to freed slaves and guaranteed them equal protection of the laws. Believing this piece of legislation overstepped the boundaries of central government. He felt this sort of lawmaking was up to each state, he again vetoed it. But this time Congress mustered the votes it needed to overturn a presidential veto. It was the first of many veto overrides during Johnson's administration. Feeling Johnson was ill-equipped to run the nation. Congress moved its meeting time so that it could keep an eye on the executive branch. Meantime, Congress was guiding Reconstruction policy. The southern states were being run by their military administrators, reporting to General Ulysses S. Grant. 1822 to 1885, in 1867 Congress passed a law, the Tenure of Office Act. Preventing the President from removing any cabinet member without Congress's permission. By this time, Congress has already begun to consider whether Johnson ought to be impeached. That fall, President Johnson pardoned many Confederate generals and officials. Further raising the ire of Congress and the nation. Johnson's popularity was waning. The following February. 
Grant attempted to replace Edwin Stanton, 1814 to 1869, as Secretary of War. Stanton, who was favored by Congress, refused to leave his office. Physically chaining himself to his desk. Congress viewed Johnson's move as a violation of the Tenure of Office Act and proceeded to hold impeachment hearings in the House of Representatives. Within a few days, the House approved a resolution of impeachment. On March 13, the trial began in the Senate. On May 19 the Senate voted on one of the articles of impeachment it was considered to be the one most likely to receive the two-thirds majority vote required to convict the President. The measure failed by one vote. Subsequent votes resulted in the same tally. While many believe Johnson was an inadequate and unpopular president who made numerous mistakes while in office. Many others believe he was not guilty of the high crimes and misdemeanors called for in Article 2, Section 4, of the Constitution. In fact, the law that he was accused of breaking. The Tenure of Office Act was later overturned as unconstitutional. When did the United Nations begin its work? The United Nations, UN, began fulfilling its mission very soon after it was chartered. The first meeting was held January 10, 1946, when the inaugural session of the General Assembly opened in London. On February 14, the UN voted to make its headquarters in the United States. Its complex was built in Manhattan, overlooking New York's East River, in 1950. Who were the most important rulers of the Roman Empire? The 500 Years of the Roman Empire, 27 B. C to AD 476, gave history some of its most noteworthy and most diabolical leaders. The major emperors are names that are familiar to most every student of Western civilization. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Trajan. Marcus Aurelius, Diocletian, and Constantine I, called the Great. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero were the first five emperors. A succession covering 75 years of Roman rule. Octavian, 63b.ca.d14, later known as Augustus. Became Roman emperor when, after the assassination of his great uncle, Julius Caesar. A power struggle ensued and he defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra to take the throne. Under Augustus's rule. From 27 BC to AD 14 began the 200 years of the Pax Romana, a period of relative peace. During this time no power emerged that was strong enough to sustain conflict with the Roman army. Consequently, Rome was able to turn its attention to the arts, literature, education, and trade. As second emperor of Rome, Tiberius, 42b.ca.d37, came under the influence of Roman politician and conspirator Sejanus. 
D.A.D. 31. Tiberius was the adopted son of Emperor Augustus. And though he had been carefully schooled and groomed to take on the leadership role, ultimately he became a tyrannical ruler, the final years of his reign were marked by viciousness and cruelty. Upon Tiberius's death, his nephew Caligula, AD 12-41, ascended the throne. Born Gaius Caesar. He was nicknamed Caligula, meaning little boots. Since he was brought up in military camps and at an early age had been dressed as a soldier. For a short time Caligula ruled with moderation. But not long after he came to power. He fell ill and thereafter exhibited the erratic behavior for which he is well known. Most scholars agree that Caligula must have been crazy. He was murdered in AD 41, and Claudius. Also nephew to Tiberius, was then proclaimed emperor. Claudius. 10b.ca.d54, renewed the expansion of Rome, waging battle with Germany, Syria. And Mauritania, present-day Algeria and Morocco, and conquering half of Britain. Though his administration was reportedly well run, he had his enemies, among them was his niece. Agrippina the Younger, AD 1559, who is believed to have murdered him in 54, after securing her son. Nero, as successor to the throne. In Nero, AD 37-68, the early Roman Empire had perhaps its most despotic ruler. Though his early years in power were marked by the efficient conduct of public affairs. In 59 he had his mother assassinated, she reportedly had tried to rule through her son. And Nero's legacy from that point forward is one of ruthless behavior. He was involved in murder plots, ordered the deaths of many Romans. Instituted the persecution of Christians, and led an extravagant lifestyle that emptied the public coffers. He was declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and in the year 68 took his own life. With the exception of Augustus, the first century AD of the Roman Empire was marked by Extreme rulers the 2nd century AD was marked by the leadership of soldiers and statesmen. Trajan, 53 to 117, who ruled from the year 98 until his death 19 years later. Is best known for his military campaigns, which expanded Rome's territory. He was also a builder constructing bridges, roads, and many buildings. When Marcus Aurelius, 121-80, ascended to emperor in 161. He had already been in public office for more than 20 years. A man of great experience, he was reportedly both learned and of gentle character. His generals put down revolting tribes, and in addition to winning victories along the Danube River. His troops also fought barbarians in the north. Why was the Mars Pathfinder project important? The historical space project yielded a tremendous amount of data even more than scientists had planned or hoped about the planet, totally reshaping many long-held notions about Mars, 
the fourth planet in the solar system. Pathfinder landed on Mars on July 4, 1997, and deployed a two-foot-long robotic rover called Sojourner. The small rover collected what project scientists described as a staggering amount of data. 2.3 billion bits of information about the planet, 8.5 million measurements of temperature and pressure. 16 chemical analyses of rocks, soil, and other surface materials, and 16,500 pictures. Among other things, the new data caused scientists to rethink the planet's color. Long believed to be red, the color is now described as a deep amber or butterscotch. The evidence gathered by Sojourner supports the notion that there may have been life on Mars. Future projects aimed at studying the planet's properties will further explore the theory that there was once life on Mars. With the success of Pathfinder, project scientists turn their attention to improving the data gathering. Capabilities of future rovers including the addition of brushes to the robot. So that dust can be collected from rocks on the surface of Mars, which is a distance of 155 million miles from Earth. What is capitalism? The cornerstones of capitalism are private ownership of property, capital goods. Property and capital create income for those who own the property or capital. Individuals and firms openly compete with one another, with each seeking its own economic gain. So that competition determines prices, production, and distribution of goods and participants in the system are profit-driven, in other words, earning a profit is the main goal. Capitalism is the antithesis of socialism. A theory by which government owns most, if not all, of a nation's capital. There is no pure capitalist system. National governments become involved in the regulation of business to some degree. But the economy of the United States is highly capitalistic in nature. As are the economies of many other industrialized nations, including Great Britain. What was the impact of network television? The big three networks rose to power in the 1950s and dominated television for the next two decades. During much of this period, they captured more than 90% of the total viewing audience. Americans had turned away from the radio programs and films that had diverted them. In the post-war 1940s and were tuning into television dash the tube at an average rate of 25 hours per week. Leaving little time for any other recreational pursuits. In short, television had become not only an American pastime, but an American obsession. Radio, which had given birth to television, both NBC and CBS were radio networks before. They began developing TV programming, saw its revenue cut in half almost overnight. It not only lost audiences and advertisers to TV, but lost popular programs and stars as well. Radio turned its attention to an emerging new art form 
rock and roll. The move was a success, as young listeners tuned in to hear the music. That was considered too raw to be included in the evening TV lineup. Film felt the effects of television as well, as audiences stayed home to be entertained. Movie makers attempted to lure audiences back into the theaters with gimmicks including 3D movies. Panavision, Cinemascope, and Circle Vision. Hollywood abandoned the Western and other B-movies in favor of big-budget blockbusters. Many of which were filmed on location rather than at studios or on back lots. Studios even forbade their stars from appearing on TV, but they soon relented. Cooperation between the two industries is what saved film. Studios sold old movies to the networks for broadcast and provided production talent and facilities to television. Newspapers were least affected by the tremendous popularity of television. Since programming time was at first limited to 8 p.m. to 11 p.m., which still left time to read the paper. As soon as television expanded programming beyond that three-hour window, however. Newspapers felt the pinch more sharply in 1963, when both CBS and NBC began airing news shows. Daytime programming spelled the demise of the evening paper. While television had no impact on the number of books published, it did prompt a decrease in the number of fiction titles that were published, and a corresponding increase in the number of non-fiction titles. The upward trend of non-fiction titles is a lasting effect of television on the publishing industry. Today experts disagree over the impact of television on our lives. Some argue that increased crime is a direct outcome of television since programs. Show crime as an everyday event and advertisements make people more aware of what they don't have. Critics also maintain that television stimulates aggressive behavior, reinforces ethnic stereotyping, and leads to a decrease in activity and creativity. Proponents of television counter, citing increased awareness in world events. Improved verbal abilities, and greater curiosity as benefits of television viewing. By the end of the 1950s, more than 50 million American families owned a television. Who was Baiko? Stephen Baiko, 1946 to 1977, was a black leader in the fight against South African apartheid and white minority rule. In 1969, Baiko, who was then a medical student, founded the South African Students' Organization, which took an active role in the black consciousness movement a powerful force in the fight against apartheid. Preaching a doctrine of black self-reliance and self-respect. Baiko organized protests, including anti-government strikes and marches. Viewing such activities as a challenge to its authority and fearing an escalation of unrest. In August 1977, the white government had Baiko arrested. Within one month, he died in prison. Evidence indicated he had died at the hands of his jailers. A revelation that only cemented anti-government sentiment. 
along with Nelson Mandela, 1918, who was imprisoned in South Africa from 1962 to 1990 for his political activities, Vico became a symbol of the anti-apartheid movement. Galvanizing support for racial justice at home and abroad. What was the impact of network television? The big three networks rose to power in the 1950s and dominated television for the next two decades. During much of this period, they captured more than 90% of the total viewing audience. Americans had turned away from the radio programs and films that had diverted them. In the post-war 1940s and were tuning into television dash the tube at an average rate of 25 hours per week. Leaving little time for any other recreational pursuits. In short, television had become not only an American pastime, but an American obsession. Radio, which had given birth to television, both NBC and CBS were radio networks before. They began developing TV programming, saw its revenue cut in half almost overnight. It not only lost audiences and advertisers to TV, but lost popular programs and stars as well. Radio turned its attention to an emerging new art form, rock and roll. The move was a success, as young listeners tuned in to hear the music. That was considered too raw to be included in the evening TV lineup. Film felt the effects of television as well, as audiences stayed home to be entertained. Movie makers attempted to lure audiences back into the theaters with gimmicks including 3D movies. Panavision, Cinemascope, and Circle Vision. Hollywood abandoned the Western and other B-movies in favor of big-budget blockbusters. Many of which were filmed on location rather than at studios or on back lots. Studios even forbade their stars from appearing on TV, but they soon relented. Cooperation between the two industries is what saved film. Studios sold old movies to the networks for broadcast and provided production talent and facilities to television. Newspapers were least affected by the tremendous popularity of television. Since programming time was at first limited to 8 p.m. to 11 p.m., which still left time to read the paper. As soon as television expanded programming beyond that three-hour window, however, newspapers felt the pinch more sharply in 1963, when both CBS and NBC began airing news shows. Daytime programming spelled the demise of the evening paper. While television had no impact on the number of books published, it did prompt a decrease in the number. Of fiction titles that were published, and a corresponding increase in the number of nonfiction titles. The upward trend of nonfiction titles is a lasting effect of television on the publishing industry. Today, experts disagree over the impact of television on our lives. Some argue that increased crime is a direct outcome of television since programs. Show crime as an everyday event and advertisements make people more aware of what they don't have. Critics also maintain that television stimulates aggressive behavior, reinforces ethnic stereotyping, 
and leads to a decrease in activity and creativity. Proponents of television counter, citing increased awareness in world events. Improved verbal abilities, and greater curiosity as benefits of television viewing. By the end of the 1950s, more than 50 million American families owned a television. What was the Bataan Death March? It was one of the most brutal chapters of World War II. 1939-45 On April 9, 1942, American forces on the Bataan Peninsula, Philippines, surrendered to the Japanese. More than 75,000 American and Filipino troops became prisoners of war, POWs. On April 10, they were forced to begin a 65-mile march to a POW camp. Conditions were torturous high temperatures, meager provisions, and gross maltreatment. The troops were denied food and water for days at a time, they were not allowed to rest in the shade. They were indiscriminately beaten, and those who fell behind were killed. On stretches where some troops were transported by train. The boxcars were packed so tightly that many POWs died of suffocation. The forced march lasted more than a week. 20,000 men died along the way. But the end of the march was not the end of the horrors for the surviving POWs. About 56,000 men were held until the end of the war. They endured starvation, torture, and horrific cruelties. Some were forced to work as slave laborers in Japanese industrial plants and some became subjects of medical experiments. In August 1945 their POW camp was liberated by the Allied forces, and the surviving troops were put on. U.S. Navy vessels for the trip home as part of the United States 1951 peace treaty with Japan. Surviving POWs were barred from seeking reparations from Japanese firms that had benefited from their slave labor. This injustice continued to be the subject of proposed congressional legislation into the early 2000s. With no positive outcome for the veterans as of 2005. Why is stem cell research controversial? Stem cell research raises important bioethical issues. Stem cells have the potential to develop into all body tissues. And they may be able to replace diseased or defective human tissue. The best source for these cell clusters is human embryos, which are destroyed when the stem cells are extracted. Opponents to the research, including any on the religious right who also oppose abortion, argue that the embryo is a potential human life and therefore should not be destroyed for the sake of science. But proponents of the controversial research say that a variety of treatments and cures for diseases could be gained through scientific advancements made because of stem cell research. Supporters add that the embryos cannot develop on their own and therefore should be put to use for the sake of better medicine which could help people who suffer from many different diseases.
including diabetes, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's, thus improving and extending human life. It is important to note that the embryos exist in laboratories because of advances. Previously made in reproductive science. In August 2001 the George W. Bush administration moved cautiously forward on the issue by allowing stem cell research as long as it is limited to existing cells, the embryos having already been destroyed. In other words, new stem cells cannot be created strictly for the purpose of laboratory work. Bush said he concluded that federal funding should be used to support research on 60 existing genetically diverse stem cell lines, which have the ability to regenerate themselves indefinitely. The president acknowledged the complexity of the issue, saying in a radio address, at its core. This issue forces us to confront fundamental questions about the beginnings of life and the ends of science. It lies at a difficult moral intersection, juxtaposing the need to protect life in all its phases with the prospect of saving and improving life in all its stages. But, he added, for the existing stem cell lines, the life and death decision has already been made. Over the next few years, state legislatures took up the issue, creating a patchwork of policies across the nation by 2005. Who are the leakies? The prominent British family has included four scientists who have made significant anthropological findings in East Africa. Family patriarch Louis S. B. Leakey, 1903-1972, was born near Nairobi, Kenya. The oldest child of British missionaries. There he grew up learning the tribal language of the Kikuyu people before he learned English and wandering the countryside. Where he discovered primitive stone arrowheads and tools. While attending Cambridge University, Leakey determined that he would pursue a career in archaeology. And he went on to earn his doctorate degree. Louis Leakey married archaeologist and artist Mary Douglas, 1913-1996, in 1936, returning to Leakey's boyhood home to conduct their work. The husband and wife team made their first discovery of note in 1948, near Lake Victoria, Kenya, they found more than 30 fragments of the skull of an ape-like creature. Scientists concluded that the animal was a common ancestor of humankind and apes and had lived between 25 and 40 million years ago. The Leakeys made their most well-known discoveries in neighboring Tanzania during the late 1950s and into the 1960s. Proving that human evolution was centered in Africa. At the Old Duve Gorge, a 35-mile long ravine, the archaeologists discovered layers of Earth's history, including almost 100 forms of extinct animal life. They also unearthed the fossils of a near man, Zinjanthropus, who possessed a brain about half the size of the modern human and who walked upright at a height of about 5 feet roughly 1.75 million years ago. Because he lived on a diet of nuts and meat, the discovery came to be called Nutcracker Man. 
Subsequent findings at the gorge included that of Homo habilis, called Abel Man. Since it is believed that he made use of the stone tools found nearby. Louis Leakey later decided the two human like creatures, Abel Man and Nutcracker Man, had actually lived in the same place at the same time, meaning that the Evolution of humankind was not along the linear path that had been thought. While Leakey's controversial conclusion challenged the scientific community. So would the finds of their scientist son Richard, 1944- in the decades that followed his parents' discoveries at Old Duve Gorge. Richard pursued his own projects at Lake Turkana in north-central Kenya. There Richard discovered more than 200 early man fossils. Like his father, Richard Leakey is part of a husband and wife team of scientists. In 1971 he married British-born Meve Epps, 1942. A zoologist and paleontologist who had been hired by Louis Leakey in 1965 to work on his African digs. Together Richard and Meve Leakey, along with American anthropologist Alan Walker, have discovered and identified some of the oldest known human-like fossils. In 1994 and 1995, near Lake Turkana, the team found prehistoric fossils. Identified as Australopithecus anamnesis, human-like creatures that lived about 4 million years ago. Who are the Jesuits? The Jesuits are members of a Roman Catholic religious order called the Society of Jesus. The group was founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola, 1491-1556. Born into nobility as Inigo de Onas y Loyola, the Spaniard became a knight in 1517. In that capacity he fought against the French in their siege 1521 of Pamplona, northeast of Madrid. But he was seriously wounded in the battle and retreated to a commune in northeast Spain from 1522 to 1523. There Ignatius heard a religious calling and subsequently undertook a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, 1523 to 1524. Committed to a religious life. He embarked on a program of disciplined writing and study in Spain and in Paris, France. Even before he was ordained in 1537, Ignatius had gained followers. The Spanish missionary Francis Xavier, 1506-1552, among them. With his companions Ignatius founded the Society of Jesus in 1539, the religious order was approved by Pope Paul III, 1468 to 1549, the following year. Jesuits are known for leading structured lives and for their self discipline, commitment to the Pope, and missionary work. They have a profound belief in education and as such have long been leaders in learning and in the sciences. The order was suppressed in 1773 but restored in 1814. Why were the Rosenbergs tried?
husband and wife Julius, 1918-1953, and Ethel Rosenberg. 1915-1953, were tried for conspiracy to commit wartime espionage. Arrested in 1950, the Rosenbergs were charged with passing nuclear weapons data to the Soviets. Enabling the communists to develop and explode their own atomic bomb an event that had been announced to the American public by President Truman on September 23, 1949. As the realization set in that the United States could now be the victim of an atomic attack, the anxieties of the Cold War heightened. What is the doctrine of idols? This was a phrase used by English philosopher Sir Francis Bacon. 1561-1626, in his written attack on the widespread acceptance of the thinking of ancient philosophers such as Aristotle, 384-322b. C. and Plato, C. 428-347 BC, and the founder of modern astronomy, Copernicus, 1473-1543. In his 1620 work, Novum Organum, Bacon vehemently argues that human progress is held back by adherence to certain concepts, which it does not question. By hanging on to these concepts, or idols, humankind may proceed in error in its thinking. The double edge is that in holding to notions accepted as true, we run the danger of dismissing any new notion, a tendency Bacon characterized as arrogance. A quality that goes hand in hand with arrogance is skepticism. In adhering to that which we know, we are likely to dismiss any new ideas. To combat these obstacles, Bacon advocated a method of persistent inquiry. He believed that humans can understand nature only by carefully observing it with the help of instruments. He went on to describe scientific experimentation as an organized endeavor. That should involve many scientists and which requires the support of leaders. Thus, Bacon is credited with no less than formulating modern scientific thought. What was the diet of worms? In 1521 a diet, which is another word for an imperial council or an assembly of princes, was convened at Worms, situated on the Rhine River in Germany. This particular meeting had been called by Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, 1501558, to consider the crisis that had been brought on by the Reformation. Since Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546, was instrumental in both igniting the movement and furthering its causes. He was called before the Diet to testify and defend himself. But the religious leader refused to yield his stance. He vowed to continue to make his argument against the Church. He closed his statement with these famous words, Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. The result of this was that on May 25th the Edict of Worms was issued, declaring Martin Luther an outlaw.
however, Luther sought refuge in the protection of Frederick the Wise. And the edict itself served only to galvanize the cause of the reformers. Did the Roman Republic precede the Roman Empire? Yes, the Roman Republic, which for centuries afterward was considered the model form of a balanced government, was established in 509 B.C. The Roman Empire was not established until 27 B.C. when Augustus, also known as Octavian, 63 B.C.A.D. 14, became its first ruler. In brief, the development of ancient Rome is as follows. In 753 BC the city of Rome was established. Legend has it, the city was founded by brothers Romulus and Remus. Situated on wooded hills above the Tiber River, about 15 miles from the sea. Rome enjoyed the advantages of access to trade routes while having natural protection from aggressors. The city was defensible. Agriculture prospered in the area. As did other economic endeavors including manufacturing and mining. In 509 BC the Republic was established by noblemen. The government was headed by two elected officials who were called consuls. Since they shared power, a certain measure of balance was ensured in that either one could veto the actions of the other. And the posts were brief, each elected official served for only one year. These heads of state were guided by the Roman Senate which was made up of senior statesmen. There were also assemblies in which the people had a voice. In 390 BC Rome was captured and sacked by the Gauls. A Celtic people from Western Europe, who were able to hold it for a short time. About 300 BC the Romans came into contact with the Greeks. Adopting not only some of their ideas, but their mythology as well. The Greek gods and goddesses were soon given Roman names. By 275 BC Rome controlled most of the Italian peninsula. Their homeland stable, the Romans set their sights on overseas expansion. And between 264 and 146 BC fought the Punic Wars in order to gain territory. They conquered the Mediterranean islands of Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. Part of Gaul, much of Spain, and Carthage, in northern Africa. In the last century BC Rome entered a period that is considered the height of their civilization. But about the middle of that century, the Republic was torn by civil wars. After 20 years of fighting, the Roman Empire was formed in 27 BC when Augustus Octavian became the first emperor. While vestiges of the Republic were maintained, the emperor held supreme authority. Nominating the consuls and appointing senators, controlling the provinces, and heading the army. The civilian assemblies were still in place, but had for the most part lost their voice in government. The Roman Empire lasted nearly 500 years. By the 3rd century AD Roman armies had conquered. So many peoples that the empire stretched across Europe and included the entire Mediterranean coast. 
of Africa as well as parts of the Middle East. During this time of power and expansion, trade thrived over a vast network of roads and sea routes, which extended to China, India, and Africa. Coins, made of gold, silver, copper, and bronze, were issued and controlled by the Roman government. In 395, upon the death of Emperor Theodosius the Great, 347 to 395, the Roman Empire was divided into two. East and West. In 476, after suffering a series of attacks from nomadic Germanic tribes, Rome fell. What were the Gulags? Gulags were prisons for political dissidents in the Soviet Union. The prisons existed from 1919 into the 1950s. Gulag is an abbreviation of the Russian name of the system. Globnoye upravilnaya is provital no trudovic logary, which translates to chief administration of corrective labor camps. The camps were first used during the collectivization of agriculture in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Under Soviet leader Joseph Stalin's 1879-1953 purges of the 1930s, anyone who posed or seemed to pose a threat to his hardline communist regime was rounded up and sent to a gulag. During World War II, 1939-45, prisoners of war were held in the gulags. And after the war, Stalin continued to use the camps to punish those who opposed him. Though exact figures are unknown, it is believed that as many as 30 million people were imprisoned in gulags. Where they faced forced labor, grueling conditions, and maltreatment including starvation. Official Soviet figures place the number around 10 million. Millions are believed to have died in the gulags. After Stalin died in 1953, the system was dismantled, with some of the prisoners receiving amnesty. What were the killing fields? After communist leader Pol Pot, 1928-1998, head of the Khmer Rouge, took over the Cambodian government in 1975, he ordered a collectivization drive, rounding up anyone who was believed to have been in collusion with or otherwise supported the former regime of Lan Nol, 1913-1985. The government instituted executions, forced labor, in so-called re-education camps and famine combined to kill one in every five Cambodians, or an estimated two million people, during Pol Pot's reign. He was removed from power in the Vietnamese invasion of 1978-1979, and he died in hiding. In 1998. On December 29 of that year, two former Khmer Rouge leaders surrendered to authorities. Q Sam Phan, age 67, and Nguyen Chia, 71. The two appeared in a televised news conference. Asked if he was sorry for the suffering that claimed the lives of millions of Cambodians. Q Sam Phan looked straight at the questioner and answered in English, Yes, sorry, very sorry. Nguyen Chia, said, we are very sorry. 
not just for the human lives but also animal lives that were lost in the war. However, neither Sam Fan nor Chia accepted personal responsibility for the killing fields. While Sam Fan pled not to be tried for his crimes and Prime Minister Hun Sen, 1950. Of Cambodia seemed inclined toward closing the book on this dark chapter in the country's history. There was public outcry to bring the former Khmer leaders to justice. Supporters of a trial assert that Cambodia will have no peace until someone is punished for the killing fields for the Khmer's genocidal regime. When was the New York Stock Exchange founded? The oldest and largest stock exchange in the United States, the New York Stock Exchange. NYSE, had its origins on May 17, 1792, when local brokers who had been buying and selling Securities under a designated tree agreed to formalize their business transactions. The NYSE that most people would recognize today opened for business in 1825 at 11 Wall Street, New York City. At the time most shares traded were in canal, turnpike, mining, and gaslight companies. Though a few industrial securities were first traded on the New York Stock Exchange as early as 1831. It was another 40 years before the complexion of trading changed to a more industrial nature. As the nation became increasingly manufacturing oriented. The companies listed on the exchange reflected the economic shift. Today, if corporations wish to list their stocks on the NYSE, they must have a minimum of 2,000 shareholders, each of those original shareholders must have 100 or more shares. The corporation must be able to issue at least 1 million shares of stock. And it must also provide a record of earnings for the previous three-year period. The board of the stock exchange can make exceptions to these guidelines. Corporations may be listed with other stock exchanges, such as the American Stock Exchange. Or they may allow stock in their company to be traded as unlisted stocks. Which are bought and sold in over-the-counter, OTC, trading. Companies that do not allow shares to be publicly traded are called private corporations. What did Silent Spring have to do with the environmental protection movement? The 1962 work by American ecologist Rachel Carson, 1907 to 1964, cautioned the world on the ill effects of chemicals on the environment. Carson argued that pollution and the use of chemicals, particularly pesticides, would result in less diversity of life. The best-selling book had wide influence, raising awareness of environmental issues and launching green environmental protection movements in many industrialized nations. Is it true that the engineers of the Challenger's O-rings warned NASA that the devices might fail?
Yes, but sadly the advice of the engineers went unheeded, the O-ring manufacturer, Morton Thiokol. Gave the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, the go-ahead in the hours before Challenger's takeoff. On January 27, 1986, the night before the planned takeoff. The temperature at Cape Canaveral, Florida, dropped to well below freezing. Since no shuttle had been launched in temperatures below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. NASA undertook a late-night review to determine launch readiness. As a contractor, Morton Thiokol participated in this process. With their engineers expressing concerns about the O-rings on the shuttle's solid rocket boosters. They feared the rings would stiffen in the cold temperatures and lose their ability to act as a seal. Since the space agency was under pressure to launch the shuttle on schedule, NASA managers pushed the manufacturer for a go or no go decision. The managers of Thiokol, who were aware that the O rings had never been tested at such low temperatures, signed a waiver stating that the solid rocket boosters were safe for launch at the colder temperatures. Challenger was launched the next morning, at 11.38 a.m., about one minute into the flight. A flame became evident, and seconds later, the spacecraft exploded. All seven crew members died. Investigators later concluded that the tragic accident had been caused by the failure of the O-rings. What is a Trojan horse? B. C. A Trojan horse has come to symbolize anything that looks good but is actually subversive. According to his Trojan War epic The Iliad. After nearly ten years of fighting the Trojans for control of their city. The Greek Mycenaean army built a huge wooden horse on wheels and offered it as a gift to their enemy. Leaving the peace offering outside the city walls of Troy, the Mycenaean army then departed. Despite warnings, including one from the Trojan princess Cassandra, the Trojans accepted the gift. And they opened the gates and wheeled the huge wooden horse into the city. It was a naive move, once the horse was inside the city gates. Mycenaean soldiers who were hidden inside the wooden structure took Troy by storm. Ending the decade-long campaign and taking control of the lucrative Black Sea trade. What were the navigation acts? Between 1645 and 1761 British Parliament passed a series of 29 laws intended to tightly control colonial trade, shipping, and industry to the benefit of English interests in America. These acts, which were largely ignored by the American colonists, were intended to ensure that the British colonies in North America remain subservient to the mother country. The initial act of 1645 forbade the import of whale oil into England. Unless it was transported aboard English ships with English crews. Subsequent laws, those passed in 1651, 1660, 
and 1663, provided the basis of the Navigation Acts. The first Navigation Act, 1651, resembled the legislation of 1645, but was more far-reaching. It stipulated that goods could only enter England, Ireland, or the colonies aboard English, or English colonial, ships. Further, colonial coastal trade was to be conducted entirely aboard English ships. The Second Navigation Act, 1660, reaffirmed that goods could only be transported aboard English ships and established a list of enumerated articles that had to be shipped directly to England. The intent was to prevent the colonies from trading directly with any other European country. England required the colonies to sell their materials to English merchants or pay duties on goods sold to other countries. The list of articles included sugar, cotton, tobacco, indigo, rice, molasses, apples, and wool. In 1663 Parliament passed the Staple Act, making it illegal for colonies to buy products directly from foreign countries. European countries would first need to ship their products to England or pay customs fees. Through the Navigation Acts England tried to establish itself as the gatekeeper of colonial imports and exports. But the laws were difficult to enforce, and the colonists easily circumvented them. Smuggling was rampant. Still, the laws, which continued to be passed until the eve of the American Revolution, 1775-83, had little effect on the colonial economy, which grew at twice the rate of England's during the period. Who were the Huns? The Huns were a nomadic Central Asian people who, in the middle of the 4th century a. d. moved westward. They first defeated the Alani, a group in the Caucasus mountain region. Between the Black and the Caspian Seas, and then conquered and drove out the Goths. Unified by the ruler Attila in 434, the Huns gained control of a large part of Central and Eastern Europe by about 450. The Italian countryside was ravaged in the process. And many people sought refuge on the numerous islands in the lagoon of Venice, the settlement later became the city of Venice. With the death of Attila in 453, the subjects of the Huns revolted and defeated them. The Huns were later absorbed into the various peoples of Europe. 